Hi all, I have another fascinating game to show you from TSEC. This has been much requested actually in some of the recent streams. It's uh, game 44, so of that amazing 100 game match in the TSEC season 17 super final. So this is round 44. Leela playing white against Stockfish. The opening set, E4, we have the Scandinavian defence. It used to be called, I believe, the centre counter defence, and it was scorned on by some uh, players like Nimzovic, uh, saying it really didn't help development. So he actually gave it as an example of a bad opening, I believe, and gaining tempo, and how it's important not to lose too many tempo in the opening. So E takes D5, Queen takes D5. Things are not so simple in chess, though, because this tempo gaining move knight c3, yes, it does gain a tempo from the queen, but it does restrict the c2 pawn. And quite often, black now has got also a nice perk of the d-file pressure, so black can often set up a solid position later if white's not careful, getting the bishop outside of the pawn chain first. Putting this pawn on e6, this pawn on c6, and it looks rather solid after difficult to crack, because if you haven't got a strategic pawn break, uh, is the gain of tempo that significant? Now, traditionally, uh, you know, queen a5, queen d8 have been moves, but in recent years, uh, we see this super trendy queen d6, and wiki indicates about queen d6. Uh, it says it offers another way to play against free knight c3. And it has been growing in popularity in recent years. At first sight, the move may look dubious, exposing the queen to a later knight b5 or bishop f4. Uh, but uh, for many years, it was, and it was, and for many years, it was poorly regarded for this reason. So it was poorly regarded because you can gain, you know, further tempos basically later when you move the pawn. You can sometimes get a bishop, you know, to f4. Uh, so that's why its popularity hasn't been great. Uh, However, numerous Grandmaster games have since shown that Queen d6 to be quite playable, however, and it has been played many times in high-level chess since the mid-1990s. White players against this line have found an effective setup with d4, knight f3, g3, bishop g2, uh, castling, and a future knight e5 with a strong active position. And the variation has been covered thoroughly in a 2002 book by Michael Meltz. Okay, so... Uh, we see the, the book actually expressing uh, for this game, d4, knight f6, knight f3, expressing actually, um, so a6, the fianchetto, or fianchetto, g3. Uh, for a moment though, commenting on a6, yes, this is rather interesting. It does stop, both stop knight b5, and also maybe black later might consider b5 and bishop b7. Uh, let's put more uh, pressure on, on the center. So anyway, g3 does provide the other tempo gaining opportunity it wasn't just knight b5 it was bishop f4 sometimes uh, and this is the end of the book here and stockfish chooses bishop g4 leela does go in for the tempo gain and now we see stockfish playing a rather cheeky check a cheeky check queen e6 check so why this cheeky check well Let's uh, have a look first at bishop takes f3. You might think to grab a pawn. This is very, very doubtful because uh, queen takes b7. And uh, there's only a, a one threat or two to handle. And uh, black gets crushed here totally into oblivion. So that's not worth playing. <laughs> so yeah, in case you're wondering, bishop takes f3. Uh, let's just rule that out. So queen e6 though. After bishop f4, queen e6 check, we have the bishop dropping back. So this has kind of lost the tempo, but you can see again, this side effect sometimes of gaining a tempo is blocking in key pawns. That e7 pawn is now hemmed in, so that's pretty uncomfortable. So not everything is about gaining a tempo. Uh, if white had played uh, bishop e2, then that's a disaster after bishop takes f3. Yeah. That's uh, that's not too uh, clever at all. You know, d5, bishop takes e2, hitting the queen. So that's that's just losing material. So bishop e3. And we have the move queen f5. And now Lila has to be careful, actually, about a routine-looking uh, bishop e2. If bishop g2, uh, this leaves quite a nasty pin here. And in fact, black might be able to celebrate this uh, 
with um, rook d8 or queen h5 a uh, queen h5 is is quite annoying and later rook d8 so the pin doesn't have it shouldn't really be left if black's going to play moves like that so we see bishop e2 e6 and actually Lula kicks this now and the bishop can't really go to h5 because uh, of g4 uh, let's put that on the board uh, g4 will be forking those pieces so we have actually uh, Lula getting actually a more permanent advantage from this opening in, in the form of that light square bishop however uh, Stockfish is is keen to seal the light squares and have that d5 as a blockading point so c6 the bishop doesn't look that effectual right now but we know Leela against French defense structures um, in particular you know later often plays f4 f5 to undermine and open up light square bishops so if there is a long term strategy uh, you can expect Leela to try and find it later to kind of liberate and emphasize this bishop without the counterpart for the moment we see queen e2 so no rush to castle kingside in fact the option now is castle queenside Knight bd7 we have in fact casting queenside and Stockfish is starting to play like Shigorin uh, wanting to give up the other bishop bishop b4 giving up both bishops potentially if bishop e7 uh, then for example like this uh, bishop takes c6 is a disaster for black if black dares castle queenside that dark square bishop is a bit of a killer here and uh, for example like this first thing knight b6 uh, so this is a total disaster for black and if black has the intention of castling more sensibly on uh, the queen side sorry on the king side here then it seems there's a ready-made attack potential for white with g4 and h4 and this position is very very pleasant uh, for white if if nothing else white can if black's forced to play a move like f5 the e6 pawn will become a, a major target like this for example with white getting a big advantage so yes it seems unpleasant uh, both ways of castling here actually for black uh, you know the queen and bishop eyeing c6 and a6 and these pawns ready for if black castles kingside so it seems almost like a process of elimination this bishop b4 what is it doing bishop d2 it drags the bishop back at least and now kingside castling king b1 and we have queen a5 so a certain pressure here a3 and Leela converts another sort of temporary uh, activities into a more permanent advantage arguably if the bishops can be celebrated and proven better than their knight tricky knight counterparts is that going to happen so the queen is attacked it moves to c7 we have h4 now knight d5 the bishop goes out of the way against knight c3 and we have b5 and it looks as though hold on a sec isn't black doing kind of well here because that d5 knight now you know c4 has been stopped from kicking in that uh, it's the pride of black's position isn't it here and also potentially black could play uh, you know maybe like this or b4 later or a5 b4 you know doesn't it look as though there might be some prospects here we have h5 queen b6 and now h6 leader is installing a long-term form pawn which is a very very common leader strategy so she hasn't actually uh, elected to open up with you know g4 g5 it's a bit slower so just installing the form pawn as a longer term advantage black played g6 if queen takes d4 then there's immediate pawn fragmentation of f7 and h7 and uh, this position actually also loses uh, material in fact white can even do better instead of taking the exchange just building up on the fragmented h7 pawn uh, will lead to a crushing position uh, for example like this uh, where black's under huge pressure on the king side and it crashes through so uh, yeah that's that's not to be uh, recommended uh, to allow h takes g7 so g6 the form pawn is installed so this is another long-term asset so the long-term strategic assets in the position are building up leaders kind of using the position as, as a storage device uh, not being that uh, keen to knock the opponents out uh, very quickly in fact let me draw you to this quotation I've chosen for this game now, I'm not saying the Scandinavian is necessarily a bad opening by the way I just thought it was a bit of a an interesting quote after a bad opening there is hope for the middle game 
After a bad middle game, there is hope for the end game. Once you're in the end game, the moment of truth has arrived. Uh, so Ed Mendes was actually born in Latvia and he came to the States and he was the first player to beat Bobby Fischer in the US Championship. He's written many, many books. Uh, so very, very interesting, great communicator in the game. Uh, fantastic uh, grandmaster in his own, own right. And he said this, and um, my first thought is, his openings can't be that dodgy, actually, if he often <laughs> survives to the end game. That was one thought I had. He can't be getting too demolished out of the uh, openings. So I actually checked out his openings as well. He usually plays the Sicilian defence. He hasn't actually played the Scandinavian. It's usually the Sicilian. Uh, I think he's played the French as well. Uh, so his openings are pretty non-controversial. Anyway, but here... Um, so in this trendy line here, what has Lila really disproved about the opening? Uh, Lila's just used her style of play to have longer term advantages so far. Nothing too spectacular. Uh, we have King A1. Yes, it seems um, too dangerous uh, to take on D4. There's things like Bishop B4, for example, winning the exchange. So that's that's that can't be that can't be on the card. So Rook FB8. In fact. I'll just show you that. So queen takes d4. There's bishop b4 here, hitting the rook. And just, yeah, just taking the exchange, that should be fine. So rook fb8 was played. And we have actually officially been supported, but the main reason as well, well, one, the other main reason is to discourage b4. So we have queen d8, and now the bishop drops back. a5. Uh, here, if... Uh, to explore this possession, what if knight f8? I mean, it's not inspiring. In fact, the knight has a weakness to the last move. White compounds into e5, looking looking to checkmate, and that's just going to be horrible. Uh, yeah, there's no no point playing knight f8 as an example. So anyway, a5. The knight keeps an eye on e5 because that form pawn is potentially dangerous for g7. Uh, we have now, though, after a5. An interesting decision, I felt. Uh, what would you play in this position if I gave you five seconds to pause the video? Positional judgment being tested, actually. I don't know if Leela's right. Maybe if, if you believe Leela's right, give yourself 500 points. Otherwise, maybe just 50 points for guessing Leela's move. <laughs> OK, uh, C4. Is, is Leela right about this, positionally? Because uh, uh, one argument could go, well, hasn't White inflicted structural damage, isolating the Queen's pawn here? Or is it more important to try and get to c6 and isolate a5? Are these two the major targets to be hunted down later after this fragmentation? So, okay, White's incurred um, sorry, pardon me. White, White's incurred uh, fragmentation of d4 uh, but has has the black fragmentation here, is is that much more significant well we have queen takes c4 and uh, we have queen f6 hitting uh, the bishop so you know stockfish is uh, forcing matters and Lila casually actually plays bishop e4 here not minding about potential loss of the f2 pawn well, it's pretty chilled out about pawns here. Why is that? Uh, rook c8 was played, uh, just addressing the c6 pawn issue. If queen takes f2, then rook hf1 turns out to be quite dangerous, uh, opening up pressure on f7. Now taking here, and in this position, as an example, can you guess what can white play? Okay, d5. Yeah, and this, this is quite nasty for black. After ED, uh, there's rook takes f6. And black's losing material, getting mated on g7. Uh, so yeah, d5 here is pretty pretty nasty. Uh, let's have a look at that again. <clears throat> so d5. If queen e5 here, as another example, d takes, queen takes e4, this position is good for white. The form pawn, the form pawn here is a great asset. You know, after f takes, the rooks double, 
and huge advantage for white or blacks getting mated sometimes. Uh, so, yes, it looks it looks tricky to take on f2. So, in fact, we just have the move rook c8, and now queen e2, the knight on the seventh rank goes to b6, g4, rook a b8, rook h e1, knight b7, rook f1, queen e7, f4, rook e8. Queen f3, and it looks as though the f5 break to liberate the bishop and to open up and damage d5 is really on the cards here. In fact, this is this is really neat looking as well for this bishop as well. This f5 will bring benefits to a lot of these, well, both of these. There's only two of the bishops, not a lot of them. There's only two bishops to open up and put pressure on d5 and also open up this bishop on this diagonal. So knight 7 to f6, and we have the bishop dropping back with its... Uh, partner in crime here bishop b1 is played so the bishops are lazing around here a4 is played on queen b7 as another example because that you might think is a bit committal why why that mm, my exploration here is to do a bishop a2 it looks as though white's going to be playing uh you know uh f5 anyway uh, and get a nice position anyway and fragment further you can see that the pawns are all getting fragmented here and dropping off this massive advantage potentially for white so yeah it's it's a pretty dangerous position so a4 we have actually bishop a2 king h8 rook f2 in fact leader's not in a rush to play f5 right now and in fact targets the c6 pawn and now bishop d2 is played here this knight is put on the edge of the board after g5. That's a nice perk and holding on to that form pawn securely. Okay, the issue here is both knights are looking at f4. Rook c4, but that looks at a4 now as well. So these pawns are actually being tortured rather rapidly now. Queen a7, uh, doubling on c6. Rook b8. And here, okay, the queen's looking at d4 though. Um... We have actually queen f2, and now knight e7 protecting c6. Bishop b1, queen b7. Bishop b4, queen c7, bishop d2, some playing around. So bishop e4, queen d7. Uh, here, if instead of queen d7, if we look at rook a8, if you want to try and hold on to the pawn. In fact, c6 is in big, big trouble with both bishops conspiring against it. So, for example, here and if here it takes and then taking is good actually for the queen versus the two rooks in this scenario because that bishop is making things awkward as well. In fact, there's still things like f5 and white ends up being much better here. This is a, a situation which is very pleasant for the queen. Yeah, it's it's very very difficult. Uh, you know, there's going to be invasions of the queen potentially. And other stuff. It's very, very difficult for black. So, um, so queen d7 uh, lets the a pawn go. Rook takes a4. Is this the beginning of the end? So, is Leela's positional judgment there uh, right that you know once a4 can be taken, then these are you know potentially they're going to be rolling past pawns on the side of the board later. Knight d5. We have bishop takes, queen takes. So the bishop pair given up. And it seems in theory, you know, isn't there a nice blockade square? Well, how to get to it to f5? With the form pawn on h6, how does the knight get to f5? Okay, so queen d7, rook a c4, rook b5, rook c5. And now, that after that rook drops back, queen e5. That further ties down this knight, g7. So white's dominating on the dark squares. Which is something statistically, if you look at Leela games, it seems after giving up a certain bishop of a certain colour, it seems the other colour is very exciting after. And here, look, all the pieces are on dark squares all of a sudden. Rook a8, rook 1 to c4, rook a6, rook b4. And in fact, the pressure seems to be building up on the black position. Black's just a spectator here. King b1, leisurely. A4, ominous. Rook F8, A5, ominous again. F6, so Stockfish is trying to do something in this position with F6. Of course, it's weakening E6. G takes, Knight takes, and that pawn on C6 looks fragile. Knight G4 hitting the Queen. 
yeah, if knight d5, well, I can just take on c6, as you might think, and take on e6. Thanks very much. So knight g4, queen e4, and the form pawn is taken out. Well, that's good news for black, is it? Rook takes c6, knight f5. Is it good enough news, though? Uh, yeah, because e6 dropping now. White's ended up with two connected pass pawns over here. Rook fd8, bishop c3, king f7, rook e1, rook d7, b4, knight e7. Yeah, the pass pawns are being pushed. Black's h pawn isn't that significant, it seems. The king unpins the b pawn. We have f5, which opens up the bishop on dark square, squares, potentially. Very useful. As well as these two connected pass pawns now. So, okay, it's only a pawn up, but the position is quite crushing. Because white's pawns, you know, they've got tempo gaining targets. And the king's not around there. And it seems the gravitational weight is behind them. Check. Rook g1. Uh, so the, the rook moves after being attacked there. Rook d7. Yeah, you might think, well, hold on, isn't that a threat? Could that have been addressed with king h7? Well, in this case, the bishop can entrench on e5 with a big advantage like this, with the two connected pass pawns being winning there. So it is starting to be a bit desperate for black with this pass pawn potential. So we have uh, rook takes h5, and um, yeah, it looks as though it's a two pawns down position. Let's have a, just have a look at what, how Leela plays this. It looks like a consolidation job. Yep. G5 targeted. Now just giving up um, the whole piece. That's fascinating, isn't it? Rook takes G5. You didn't expect that, did you? It seems uh, Leela thinks the two pawns, pawns, the pawns are worth more than the knight now in this endgame. So bishop takes, we have actually, instead of king takes, we have um, knight d5, actually. Yeah, it looks as though, you know, b5, b6 is so strong now. And there wouldn't even be knight d5 if uh, the king was on g5. There would be rook e5 check. So b5, b6 would just be crashing through. So Stockfish has basically given up here. It's three pawns down. Let's carry on a bit, though. Let's see. How this finished. And uh, two, yeah, it's just all over by the shouting. And here it, the game ended. So, what are the philosophical points for the way Leela handled this trendy Scandinavian variation? I think Leela used her playing style, basically, she used her long term. You know, storage playing style. Uh, install the form pawn as long term storage. Bishop pair. The controversial decision, you might ask, c4. Well, black's fragmentation was, you could argue, was more exploitable, ex more exploitable weaknesses than, than white's fragmentation. So, with that bishop pair as well, it did seem worth it in the end when a5, when the a pawn was collected, rather when it was on a4 and when that was collected it seems the beginning of the end but that didn't really ha have to much have much counterplay it seems the form pawn was restrictive to black also the knight wasn't able to get a nice blockade square uh, for a long time so yeah positional grind in Leela's style uh, the opening tempo gains just being converted as part of that style really for longer term advantages in my view uh, but what do you think we could take away as well philosophically from this game I think, yeah, it's another interesting positional uh, demonstration myself. And uh, let me know what you think about that quote uh, by Edmund Mednis. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. If you want to challenge me for a game, Kings Crusher TV, register there, and I'll be able to invite you for a game soon after, or bit.ly slash chess world. Uh, there's a suave chat form you can join at Kings Crusher TV slash Discord. There's playlists at bit.ly slash Leela Chess, or bit.ly slash Stockfish Chess. Uh, etc. Okay, comments, questions, like, shares, appreciated. Thanks very much.